Honorable President Dr. Jim Yong Kim, welcome to this forum. And it's a great pleasure for me to have a conversation, Q&A session with you. Uh, this uh, session will last one hour, but uh, we will have a Q&A for first 40 minutes, followed by question and answer from the audience. Uh, and I do have a series of questions uh, uh, ranging from uh, human development and uh, <coughs> shared prosperity, and then a uh, Korean education system, and then trust and integration, which is the theme of uh, this year's <coughs> forum, uh, followed by some concluding uh, question. Um, so for brevity, may I call you Jim? Please, uh, please yes. yes. And you may call me Steve as well. <laughs> Thank you. So Jim, uh, you moved to the US uh, with a family at the age of five and rose to become a global leader in the United States. What has led you uh, to your success? Uh, well, first of all, it's, it's great to be here uh, with you. Steve, you were, I, th I think you were the very first uh, Korean-American university president in the United States. And so I want to, uh, um, uh, uh, to give credit to you as a, as a, as a pathfinder and path, path breaker. Uh, you know, when, uh, when people ask me a, a question like that, it's, it's on first hand, it's kind of embarrassing. Um, at one point I said, well, you know, the most important thing about success is uh, choosing the right parents. Uh, and <laughs> then someone actually took it seriously and said, Does, he's a doctor, doesn't he know you can't choose your parents? Uh, but um, if I look back, um, the one thing that I think I've done is that um, when people came to me with uh, propositions that sounded impossible or that um, I could never do a job, for example, I kind of always jumped in. So, um, for example... Uh, when, um, when the Gates Foundation started, um, we, uh, uh, you know, we were uh, running a very small NGO, literally uh, begging for money to do things like treat people with tuberculosis, and, and um, uh, it was um, absolutely impossible for us to, to think ahead too many years because we just were so busy trying to raise the, the, the dollars and the pennies to keep our organization going. And then the Gates Foundation came around, and uh, people came up to us and said, well, you know, the Gates Foundation is so difficult, uh, the most you're going to be able to ask for is a, is a million dollars or two, and if you're lucky, you'll be able to get. So I said, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to ask for $45 million, and we got it. And so um, it taught me something, which is that, uh, um, you know, if you're going to fail, fail spectacularly. And, <laughs> Let them turn down a $45 million a grant proposal as opposed to a $3 million. And so then after that, we uh, were able to do things on a scale that no one had imagined. And through that, I met a wonderful Korean uh, gentleman named uh, Dr. jong Wook Lee. And uh, um, JW, as we called him, was one of the few Koreans uh, in the world of global public health. And uh, he told me once, uh, just out of the blue, I'm going to be a candidate for director general of the World Health Organization. And he, uh, he is a guy who everyone told him, possible, you can't possibly be it, because there was a prime minister who wanted the job, a former prime minister who wanted the job, former mm -hmm. minister of health. Uh, and I helped to run his campaign. And out of the blue, he won. And so I then went to his, uh, I went to the World Health Organization to work. And the one thing I wanted to do was to start HIV treatment for people in Africa. Everyone said, it's impossible, forget it. And we just set a target, three million on treatment by 2005, which was an incredibly difficult target. And uh, the, uh, when we set that target, we failed. We didn't get there. We didn't get to three million on treatment by 2005. But it turned out that setting such a bold target changed everything. And then after that, I came back. Um, uh, after uh, a few years in the World Health Organization, I came back and, um, uh, to, to Harvard. And I was um, minding my own business, being a professor. And quite, again, once again, literally out of the blue, um, a, uh, a fellow physician came up to me and said, hey, would you be interested in being president of Dartmouth? And I said, well, why me? Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, well, 
you know, we, we were supposed to look for, because he was, he was the head of the search committee for Dartmouth, and he said, we were supposed to look for a completely out-of-the-box candidate. So you're as out-of-the-box as we could think of. And so then I, um, I said, okay, well, what the heck, I'll do in the interview. And I did the interview, and the headhunter, the person who was doing the search, interviewed me for about three hours and mm-hmm. said to me, well, you know, you're an interesting guy, but there's no way that they'll choose you <laughs> to be president of Dartmouth. I said, okay, great, great, thank you. And he went off and presented me to the search committee. And a couple of investment bankers said, we want to meet this guy. Right? And so I kept meeting with them. And, you know, at the time, my, my wife was pregnant with our second child. And I asked her, I said, you know, um, should, I, should I go ahead and interview? And she looked at me and she said, well, they'll never choose you. So go ahead and interview. It'll be a good experience. <laughs> and, and then they chose me. So I went there to be uh, president of Dartmouth, and I was planning on being there for a while. And then once again, completely out of the blue, uh, a Dartmouth graduate, Tim Geithner, Timothy Geithner, who at the time was Secretary of the Treasury, Timothy Geithner called me. And um, when he calls me, it's usually because he had a friend who had a son or a daughter who wanted to get into Dartmouth. And so I literally had a piece of paper in my hand saying, and I said, Tim, so, so what's the name? And he said hey, how would you like to be president of the World Bank? And um, I, I said, well, you know, wh- wh- what do you mean? He says, well, the president would like to talk to you about being president of the World Bank. And I said, well, when does he like, would he like to talk to me? He said, how about tomorrow? So <laughs> he called me on a Monday. I met President Obama on a Tuesday. I was nominated on a Friday. Right? Now, if I look back, uh, uh, it, what, what, what was it that made me think that I could do those jobs. I think the most important thing for me was, it, I, had, I had never, these things were all accidental because I never organized my career to be something. I didn't, you know, I didn't say, well, what I want to be is a, t- a ten-year professor, what I want to be is this. I'd never had any of those th- kind of thoughts. It was always, what do I want to do? So, um, uh, you know, I wanted to be a physician who did work providing health care to poor people. And then as I, as I did that more and more and more, um, I, I, I learned that it's easier to do that if you have leverage. The first was the 45 million. Then it was working at the World Health Organization. Then it was working at Dartmouth because as president of a university, I could actually influence many, many different young people to get into the field. And then finally, the World Bank job, well, you know, we, have, we, sp- we, we, um, we are a 65, $65 billion a year organization focused specifically on ending poverty. So if there was one thing, it was, you, you, you know, you can't, you can't look inward and say, gosh, can I do this? Can I not do this? Because it's really not about you. It's about what you want to accomplish. Yes. And if, you, if you're clear that you want to do something rather than be something, then I think these opportunities uh, come up. So you had a great uh, high value uh, on your mind all the time. And uh, thinking of uh, getting out of a box and uh, aiming big. Maybe it came from your experience as a high school quarterback, to some extent. <laughs> well, yes, because, uh, you, you know, the, the Google saying is uh, fail fast, uh, fail often. And uh, at, um, when I was a high school quarterback, our team had the longest losing streak in the nation, uh, 56 <laughs> games in a row over nine years. And so I, I learned the value of failing uh, uh, through, my, through my high school quarterbacking. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And the next question is, as uh, president of the World Bank Group, uh, you must have a <clears throat> unique view of the world. And please tell me what is the most important issue on your mind uh, today. Well, you know, they're both uh, short and long-term issues. Um, uh, the the short-term issue right now is um, um, the Ebola crisis. You know, the reason, the reason we got into supporting the Ebola crisis uh, is because the potential economic impact of Ebola, uh, not just for the three countries in Africa, but for the, for the region and also potentially uh, for the continent uh, and, and maybe even for the world, uh, is to get this under control. Uh, this is the, I've, uh, I've been involved in fighting the multidrug resistant tuberculosis uh, um, outbreaks in the world. I've been involved in treating HIV. This is the worst uh, uh, crisis I've ever seen. Uh, and mm-hmm. it's still not clear that we're going to get it under control. And so um, uh, for, for me, 
it's not just a, an outbreak of a disease that's the issue. My job is to try to do everything I can to protect um, the world and protect the global economy from these unforeseen but huge potential downside risks. So um, uh, we're working very hard to fight the epidemic and put it out in those three countries, and it's going to be a very long and difficult path. Uh, but also, uh, we're really trying to think about how can we prevent these kinds of downside risks to the global economy in the future. I mean, there are, there are several. I mean, the, uh, pandemic outbreaks are a huge issue, and so one of the things we're doing at the World Bank right now is trying to think of, um, of a financial instrument that would work like something like an insurance policy that would be supported through contingent liabilities. In other words, the wealthy countries in the world would agree that if there were ever another outbreak that required immediate disbursement of money, we would have this in instrument that would disperse quickly, that would uh, get a, a sort of uh, pre-prepared uh, global uh, health service corps to go to those countries and put out these epidemics. Because the issue here is that we waited way too long. We didn't have that kind of a fund. We weren't ready. If we had responded uh, uh, 11 months ago when the first cases came out, there would be none of this uh, uh, either human or <coughs> economic impact. So, um, we, you know, the, the, the problem was that it was the classic separation between the financial people and the global health people. And now that a global health person is running a financial institution, we're going to try to bring these ideas together. So uh, if we had a you know, uh, 10, 15, 20 billion dollar immediately dispersing fund that no one would have to pay for until it dispersed, then I think it makes sense. Because right now what we're doing is we're waiting for each country to go to their legislatures and get approval for money. That's just way too slow. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. viruses don't, by their nature, wait for a political process. They just move. And so um, we think that uh, not only can we get better and learn a lot from the, the, the response to the current epidemic, but we can build tools that will prevent the economy. You know, when there is a, um, a real estate bubble that infects an entire uh, a large economy, uh, we have the IMF who can, who can jump in and support uh, uh, countries in, uh, in, in, in balance of payments, uh, uh, with their balance of payments instruments. But there is no instrument uh, to support the world when there are things like these outbreaks. So um, we're going we're gonna to build that in. Um, you, you know, uh, all of us are concerned about uh, another disappointing year in the global economy. Uh, mm -hmm. We're all um, hoping that uh, the recovery will, will, will move more quickly. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, the, the interesting thing is that compared with uh, six or seven years ago, uh, the central bankers especially and also ministers of finance are using tools that we never even considered. You know, at uh, historically low interest rates, um, you know, we've found that uh, there's still a lot that central banks can do, even if the interest rates are, are, are close to zero. And this is what's happening. The European Central Bank, Mario Draghi, is really looking at the possibility of expanding the, uh, the range of activities of the European Central Bank to stimulate the economy. You know, we see what happened in Japan uh, with, uh, with uh, Mr. Kuroda, um, you know, taking that next step in, in, in terms of uh, trying to bolster the global economy. So we're all worried, but I tell you, we're much less worried about um, uh, the downside risks than, uh, than we were when I started the, the job two years ago. Yes. Thank you. Uh, the next question I have is, uh, both you and I spent a lot of time in academia uh, as uh, leaders. Uh, we share a strong conviction uh, that uh, education is uh, truly important. But how big a role <coughs> does uh, human capital play in a country's uh, development, uh, yeah. you know, this is the um, th th this is one of the great, I think, um, insights that the that the World Bank um, has developed over over time. Uh, you know, in 1994, one of the great ironies when I went to see President Obama um, uh, in his uh, office, th this was just before three days before he nominated me. Um, I sat down and I said, you know, President Obama, I want you to know that in 1994, um, I was part of a protest movement called 50 Years is Enough, in which um, uh, we were arguing that the World Bank should close on its 50th birthday. And so um, uh, he said, yeah, I know that. I said, you're not worried about things? No, I'm not worried about that. And I had actually written a book uh, that said that the World Bank should close. 
Now, the reason I did that, the reason I wrote that, is because uh, back in those days, 20 years ago, the World Bank uh, really thought about health and education. And even though they wrote some things differently, health and education really were expenses. Uh, the most important thing, they argued, was the growth of the economy. And if, the, if GDP was growing, then all the other things like health and education would sort of fall into place. So focus first on growth, health and education. You might have to cut back your budgets there, but you know, uh, we can help you be more efficient. But I think now there's a very different view. And the, and the different view uh, comes from uh, lots of really interesting data. I think uh, OECD has done a great service in putting together the PISA test, the Program for International Student Assessment. And I think there's a very good understanding that, that performance on those tests has a very strong correlation with economic growth. So I, I think just empirically, we now know that the quality of the educational system will directly contribute to medium and long-term growth. But also, um, you know, the, 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 uh, in healthcare, uh, again, it was sort of like, well, you know, can you limit your expenses on healthcare? But now we, what we know, uh, Larry Summers um, in, in January of this year published an article in The Lancet in which he uh, showed that uh, between the, the years of 2001 and 2011, fully 24% of economic growth in low and middle income countries was due to better health outcomes. So investing in people's health, investing in people's education are now not just sort of expenses that you have to deal with, but they're your most important investments uh, for medium and long-term growth. Now, you know, uh, it's not just a matter of throwing money at these problems. If you utilize all the information we have now about more effective ways of uh, it, making your money lead to the actual outcomes you want, investment in education leading to actual uh, uh, better performance on these global tests, for example, investment in health actually leading to better health outcomes. One of the instruments that we've been developing is something called payment uh, for results. So what we do is instead of having countries make a plan and then give them the money and then they do the plan and we don't know what the outcome is, what we do is we say, okay, so we'll give you some support, but then your future support will depend on getting the results we're mm -hmm. looking for. We don't care how you do it. We'll, we'll, we'll provide yes. you technical assistance if you, if you want, but show us that you've immunized children and then you'll get the next tranche. Show us that you're actually providing real services and you'll get the next tranche. And the outcomes have been phenomenally better. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I, I think that, one, we appreciate the fact that, that the, these investments are critical, but also um, uh, we have better ways of ensuring that the money we put into the system actually gets the value at the, at the, at the end so of the day. So you don't micromanage, you just let them do it and they achieve a results. A absolutely. Uh, yes, absolutely. thank you. And, it's, and it's really, it really has worked in some of the pilots that we started. Yeah. So thank you. So related to that, um, so can you mention some countries uh, that are making good investments? Uh, <coughs> what results uh, should we uh, be looking out for? Well, I, you know, I think that um, uh, the, uh, countries uh, as disparate as India and Tanzania. India has just uh, um, uh, uh, committed to spending $29 billion on uh, primary education. Tanzania has dramatically scaled up um, its expenditures on, um, uh, uh, on education. Uh, but I just returned from Kenya. Uh, in Kenya, uh, you know, the, the um, uh, educational outcomes at the primary and secondary level are not where they would like them to be. And even though Kenya is a rapidly growing country, now lower middle income country, um, uh, a country that has really fostered private sector growth. Um, Kenya uh, has a uh, online payment system, which is just stunning. It's called M-Pesa. It was developed by uh, Safaricom, the telephone company. And um, uh, I, one of the ministers that I worked with was, um, was from the Maasai tribe. Mm -hmm. And the famous Kenyan Maasai tribe, uh, you may have seen them on the television shows, and he showed me uh, how he uses his online payment system to send payments to his mother, who speaks only Maasai, is not literate, um, doesn't even uh, know how to read um, numbers, but still she can receive money from him on her phone instantaneously and continue to support uh, the family. And so um, uh, there is this rapid development. And then what, what I saw there, though, <clears throat> which was really exciting, was a private sector educational company that, edu that provided um, uh, uh, primary education 
for $7 per pupil per month. And so this was actually competitive with the Kenyan public system, which also mm -hmm. required some fees every month. And um, these folks were um, using uh, the, the latest technology. There's a, there's a group called the Khan Academy that has developed fantastic online materials. And so, um, you know, uh, and, and one of my jobs there was to really think about how <clears throat> Kenya could incorporate these private sector groups. Uh, the Bridge Academy, it's called, has just stunning results by using uh, Khan Academy type materials, by using other online materials, uh, by using state-of-the-art approaches to how teachers interact with students, but providing teachers with intensive uh, 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 tutoring on how they can become better teachers, their outcomes were just so much better than the public system's outcomes. And so now we're, you know, it, it, it's hard, it was, it, it's still hard in Kenya and many other places to think about private sector provision of, um, of uh, 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 primary education, but this company is so good that I think it's potentially a, a, a revolution in the making. So, uh, you know, there has to be government oversight, mm -hmm. but um, uh, this truly out of the box, truly disruptive approach to providing education, I think is something that could be scaled and scaled quickly. And if we can do that, and they can also make money doing it, I mean, they're, you know, it's a, it's a company that started in the United States, and, and these young people who are running it are not trying to make huge amounts of money. But they just want to bring market forces to bear to force the educational system to become better. If we can get that going, oh my goodness, that would be, uh, that would be a tremendous um, uh, innovation. And it might give an opportunity for people like Prime Minister Modi uh, to, to not have to go through the years and years and years that it might take to improve the, improve the public system through the standard route. But if he could bring in some private sector players who would be disruptive and it would force the system to compete, I, I think that could, be, uh, uh, that, that could accelerate um, uh, uh, the, the quality of education uh, pretty rapidly. Thank you. Uh, talking about Kenya, uh, incidentally, uh, Korea Import and Export Bank is uh, giving $80 million loan uh, to Kenya, and the KAIST and the KDI are uh, helping Kenya to build, uh, for now, uh, tentatively called Kenya KAIST in Kenya. Oh, that's a great <laughs> idea. Um, talking about the education now, um, in the international arena, Korea is a thought of not necessarily true, as an education leader in the world. Uh, can you share your views as we prepare to host the World Education Forum here in uh, May 2015? Well, I, you know, I, Steve, I'd love to hear your views on this as well. <laughs> your, your kids went to school in, in the United States, right? And, um, you know, uh, I have a 14-year-old son who's just starting ninth grade, and um, uh, we regularly threaten to send him to Korea to go to school uh, <laughs> so that he can, he can gain some of the, the, the discipline that I think is built in here. I have to say, <clears throat> so uh, um, maybe I'm, maybe I'm uh, so positive about the Korean uh, educational system because I didn't go to school here. Uh, but uh, I have to say, looking at it from the outside, if you look at just the scores, the way, the, the outstanding performance on the PISA test that, that the Korean students get. And it's not just the cognitive test part that Koreans do well, the creativity. You know, there's a, there's a new test of creativity that the OECD's put together, and the Koreans were number one in the world. So I think there's a lot of really good things about the Korean system. And as I, t as I spoke about yesterday, uh, the psychological cost seems quite high and also uh, the diversity of options. You know, I had the, I had the great uh, fun and good fortune of uh, being able to have a long dinner one night with Sai, you know, you know, Gangnam style. And <laughs> Sai is, uh, thought, was, you know, thought of himself as a failure in the Korean system, but he's one of the smartest people I've ever met. Mm -hmm. It's just brilliant. But it just that it wasn't his, his, uh, his brilliance was not in the areas that are traditionally valued in the Korean educational system. And so, um, uh, you know, I think the, the problems are that, that the psychological costs are high, that there's not enough diversity in what students can take on. Um, uh, I, you know, I think the, the tutoring system, which, you know, I've heard that some of the tutors are fantastic teachers, but the tutoring system seems to 
<coughs> accentuate inequalities across um, the, the uh, Korean population because you have to pay to be able to get there. But the thing that I think is great, you know, uh, uh, in medical school, uh, in the first year of medical school, uh, just about all the students complain about having to memorize things. They say, oh, God, you know, um, uh, I was a literature major, and I like to think, and here I am trying to memorize everything, and gosh, it just feels like, you know, such busy work. And then when they get to the third year of medical school, and they're in the wards and trying to take care of patients, they think, oh, my God, I wish I'd spent more time memorizing the things that I <laughs> learned the first year. Because it's hard to be creative if you don't have anything in your head, right? So the fact that there is such intensity of memorizing facts, I don't think that's a bad thing. You know, uh, the, the, you can be more creative if you have more things with which to think, right? And, and so um, the intensity of it, the time, the, the, the I, you know, I think the inability to ask questions of your teachers, these are things that need to be improved. I mean, I think you, you can improve them. But the rigor and uh, uh, the intensity of the experience, I think is a good thing. I think it's a really good thing. I think you know, even though Sai uh, was not the top student in math and science, you know, Sai learned something about uh, when, you're gonna, when you're gonna write a song and do a dance, do it well. Do it, do it with all of your, 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 your heart and, and do it at a level uh, where uh, you know, the intensity matches um, uh, the, the nature of the task, right? And so, you know, we talk about grit, willpower, discipline. Uh, educational psychologists have been saying for a long time that it's those things uh, that you can really change. It's really hard to change your IQ once you get older, but you can always get better at willpower, discipline, grit, and I think the Korean system really does build that into kids. Now, there are other things I worry about. Um, you know, in Germany, 40% of high school graduates go on to four-year college. And the rest go into these fantastic vocational schools. In Switzerland, 25% go to college. And then the rest are eligible for partially state-funded um, uh, 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 apprenticeships. And so their educational system is perfectly matched to uh, the market. In Korea, I understand 80% of high school graduates go on to four-year college, and my understanding is that that is really a mismatch between uh, the college system and the job market. So I think, I think those are things that Korea really needs to look at, mm -hmm. take seriously. Um, uh, you know, the 80% four-year college number, if that is correct, and I understand it is, is really a concern. Because, um, you, know, you know, if you've gone to four years, if you've paid money to go to four years of college, and you come out and you realize that the job market is structured in a way that you know, will not work for you, that can cause unrest. And so, um, I, I, the, with, with those caveats, the, with, the, with the issues that I think need to be repaired, I think this is a fantastic system because it both, it both uh, has a tremendous impact in building people's cognitive abilities and knowledge. And it also builds grit, determination, which is, I think, as important uh, um, as, uh, 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 as any other um, skill that you learn. Yes, thank you. So you talked about um, the cramming method of uh, learning in uh, <coughs> Korea and uh, you know, high competition and working hard with intelligence and uh, even memorizing <coughs> a lot of uh, good things. Uh, but these days, uh, even doctors are sometimes do Google search in front of patients. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, it's true. The, uh, also, uh, my wife and I, we talk about the five Qs. Uh, IQ is uh, you know, uh, very prevalent uh, in Korea, but uh, uh, EQ, I think you, you are going to mention uh, maybe later on. And then uh, uh, the emotional Q and the artistic Q, AQ, and uh, we also talk about the social cue uh, and the spiritual cue. So we always say so we need a five cue and, and so on. Um, in Korea, uh, Korea is very used to uh, having a uh, uniform standard uh, admissions uh, and then a relevant test, uh, such as a college scholastic ability test, CSET. Uh, but nowadays, uh, universities do have uh, discretionary authority in admission, how they select the students. Uh, and a higher proportion of students living in uh, 
size Gangnam uh, district uh, in Seoul, they go to the so-called uh, Korean Ivy League schools, uh, SKY, Seoul National, uh, Korea, and the Yonsei uh, University. I thought K uh, was for KAIST. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, some people say KAIST. Uh, uh, and then uh, in order to do that, uh, they have to really work hard and they go to foreign language schools and prep schools and so on. What are the challenges of a selection that universities uh, face globally and what sorts <coughs> of uh, talent should they be looking for, uh, in your opinion? Uh, we talk about the future uh, yeah. talents. Uh. You know, um, uh, I was very involved in uh, the admissions process at Dartmouth, not, not, not in terms of um, uh, deciding who gets in and who, who doesn't, because that's taken care of by the, the dean of admissions. But I really probed into what they were doing. Um, I, I said to them, so how do you know that someone's going to be successful at Dartmouth or not successful at Dartmouth? Because we had, we had um, I think, 25,000 applications for 1,000 spots. And the average SAT score, just for people who don't know SAT, it's at an, on an 800 scale. Um, and uh, um, the average SAT score of the applicants, of the 25,000 applicants, was around 720. So it's a very highly ranked pool. And I said, out of 25,000, how do you know who is or who is not going to be successful? And so it was a very inexact science. But I think what did happen was it wasn't strictly based on scores. In fact, we rejected many, many students who had perfect scores, 800 scores. Uh, and the idea was that we're looking for the most interesting students we can find. And so uh, I remember one um, student that everybody in the Ivy League was after was someone who did not have 800 scores. I think it was in the range of uh, you know, 650 to 680. Um, but uh, it, was a, it was a Native American student who had lost both of his parents, um, who had, uh, uh, from a, a situation of incredible poverty, uh, made it to um, one of the, the local high schools, done really well, and showed tremendous promise. Right? Now, in a system where you're just doing tests, that person would have no chance to get into one of the best schools, but every single one of the Ivy League schools was after him. And so I think that, that, um, uh, that, that uh, the, the assumption that what you want in any of the best schools is not just the ones who have the perfect scores and who are going to do well no matter what, but also the people who have shown enormous uh, 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 discipline or enormous creativity or you know, one of the five cues. So we would literally try to select across the five cues for people who, uh, would, in coming together, would create an experience for the entire class that would be unlike anything you could imagine. So the value proposition of a Dartmouth education was not just that you had great professors and that you would learn, but that you would be in an environment where you would be challenged every day, not just by your professors, but by your classmates, and that you would grow up then in, in this environment knowing so much about how sort of all these different people think and feel. And so uh, that is now extremely well established uh, in the United States. And I think that um, uh, the great universities, if they start saying here in Korea, if they start saying, we don't want the ones who just do well in tests, we want the ones who show the greatest promise for taking Korea and the world forward in a whole bunch of areas. I think that would be great, but it's tough. Because then it, it, you, know, you have to be rigorous about how you're going to do it. You have to be fair. Right. And also, um, my criticism of the admissions committee was, uh, I said to them, so then after you've made all these judgments, do you go back and compare your notes and your judgments with how these students actually do? And they said they don't. Mm. And no one does. Right? So uh, it's really a supply-side intervention, right? Your, your, um, uh, the admissions officers are, um, uh, are focusing on providing the supply of a diverse and interesting class, but they're not actually looking at, at, uh, at results at the end of the day. And I think, I think they should, uh, but um, uh, uh, it's, it's much harder to do, to track these students and then to say, so what was it about what we saw in their application that led to their success? And how can we then get better 
at selecting the students that will uh, have more success. I think what they focused on is ensuring that, uh, that the class itself had so much diversity that, um, that, that, that it would be great for people. I, I, I think it works. I think it could work here, but I think it will be um, a, uh, a, a huge upheaval for, uh, uh, for Korea to do that. Thank you very much. I'd like to underline uh, Jim's mention of uh, diversity, uh, which our uh, country needs uh, in this global age. Uh, if uh, any president in the uh, Korean <coughs> university system did uh, what you did, uh, admitting maybe student has a huge promise, but uh, in terms of uh, scoring, not as high as uh, other uh, admitted students, or failed students even, they will come knock on your door and uh, protest. Yes. <laughs> Have right. you ever had such a thing at Dartmouth? Uh, Oh, yes. Uh, well, I mean, the students and the faculty protest all the time at Dartmouth, <laughs> and uh, it, it's sort of a, but, but it wasn't, you know, over specific admissions decisions, right? Uh, it wasn't over specific admissions decisions, um, and uh, uh, I, um, I, I, you know, it, at, 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 at one point it was really fought, right? When, uh, when, uh, when affirmative action, ideas around affirmative action first uh, uh, um, appeared, I think there are many people who are deeply against it, um, and and while um, uh, uh, while there still may be some who are resentful, um, I, I think that now even the majority students, even the the, the white American, uh, you know, fifth gener or you know, twentieth generation American students, would prefer to go to a school that has diversity because you're not, you know, you know the, the the world you move into is going to be very diverse, mm -hmm. and so. That's why I think American universities are some of the most uh, interesting places, because you really do meet people from all over the world, yes. from every walk of life, every socioeconomic class. And uh, it does prepare you, I think, in a, in a very uh, powerful way for, um, for the world you're walking out into. Thank you. That's a very strong, mm -hmm. excellent message to our nation. Um, you earlier mentioned that uh, the Korean education system may be thought of as uh, the uh, leader uh, in the world, yet uh, it's not really perfect. No one is perfect in the world, actually. Uh, that's why the minister job is so difficult when you become <laughs> minister of uh, education in Korea. Their <coughs> tenure is not that long, actually. <laughs> we'll see how uh, Minister Fang does. But uh, uh, in the past, Korea has uh, produced uh, many outstanding people uh, uh, for instance, UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, uh, Samsung's Lee Gun hee and the world uh, uh, figure skate champion uh, Yona Kim. Um, how do you explain this? Uh, what uh, made uh, these people so uh, successful uh, in the past? Well, I, you know, I, I, um, uh, I, I've met all of them except for, for, for Yona Kim, uh, and I'd love to meet her if she's around here somewhere. Okay. Uh, <laughs> But here's the thing, you know, uh, I had a great discussion. Uh, Bill Gates and I worked together on a lot of different issues from polio to development. And so we had a very long dinner one night. And uh, uh, we were talking about the relative merits of, uh, of cognitive ability versus determination and willpower. And um, uh, uh, Bill uh, said to me, he said, you know, Jim, look, you and I, it's not because we're smarter. And I was thinking, God, this guy's the smartest person I've ever met in my life. He said, it's not because we're smart. It's because we worked harder and we were, were more willing to fight through uh, difficulty and get to the end of the day, get to the end. That's what's really important. And we were talking about creativity and uh, specifically then the conversation turned to, to, to Korea. And um, of course, he, he works a lot with the Samsung company. <clears throat> and I said, so, so what you're saying uh, is that Korea is, is, uh, is creative. You know, people, a lot of people say that you know, Korea is not a creative economy. It's more of an efficiency economy. He goes, oh, he said, look, you know, um, I think people far underestimate the value of, of hard, hard work to improve a process or to make something that already exists better or to take things that are disparate, good ideas out there, and then actually make them... Uh, uh, functioning and a product that people will buy. And so he really, really, really emphasized um, uh, this notion that uh, determination, willpower, you know, uh, you, you know what is, what, it's not the right word, chidoksang, you know, the, the intensity of really uh, wanting to get things done. He thinks that that is so much more important 
uh, than uh, uh, having a, uh, you know, a brilliant idea that doesn't go anywhere. Mm. And so uh, uh, the question I asked him was, do you think it's possible for educational systems uh, to not only teach facts, but to build that mm -hmm. in students in a systematic way? And he said, huh, I've never thought of that before. Mm -hmm. Because his argument at the time was, well, the, the cultures that are poorer, the cultures that are emerging, they're the ones who are going to have the great advances because they have the intensity in, 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 uh, in, uh, in uh, situations of scarcity so that they'll work harder. And so um, I, I argued to him that I think that's what Korea does, that Korea has so many outstanding individuals because if you get nothing else out of the Korean educational system, you get this sense that, that, that you've got to work really hard. You know, what is it, what is it saying? <laughs> you know, you've got to just get up again and get up again and <laughs> bat your head up against it. And uh, 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 that sense, I think, is what leads to creativity. And this is, some, you know, again, Bill, uh, 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 you know, Bill Gates' notion of creativity is continuing to get up when, when you think you've already failed and go at it and go at it and go at it. Um, I think, you, you know, the, uh, I do feel for, um, uh, for the young people who have so, so much psychological stress, but there's the saying, you know, in Korea, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> and I think that that's, I think that's real. I, you know, our, our, in the United States, our great worry, uh, my wife and I, is that uh, we're not giving our, st our, our, our children enough hardship uh, uh, to, so, so that they can really, really, you know, become fully the human beings that we need them to be. Um, my mother used to say that, um, I, and I don't know where this came from, but she used to say that, you know, parents are the bones on which children sharpen their teeth. <laughs> and so, you know, the tiger mom, tiger dad phenomenon, um, we're trying desperately to be tiger parents <laughs> because, you know, without that sort of, you know, hard thing to hit your head up against, if everything is okay and whatever you feel is fine and, you know, not working hard is your choice, I, I, I think that the, the chances for creativity are quite limited. Yeah, so you talked about the tiger mom. By the way, Amy Chua at Yale, uh, I watched her growing up because her father was my advisor at ah. Berkeley. <laughs> she became very tough. Um, so like uh, many parents, Korean parents, especially mothers, uh, want their children to be very, very successful. Uh, that uh, gives enormous uh, pressure to uh, children. Um, when Ariana Huffington came, um, I interviewed uh, her like uh, uh, this fashion. I did ask, you know, many Korean mothers know how to rear up, ideally, their children, but the competition is so severe uh, in Korea, they hesitate to be the first. If they uh, relax and uh, let the children do what they want to do, uh, like in the U.S., uh, they may fail entrance exam and uh, do not uh, go to colleges they want. Uh, but uh, her answer was, uh, my mother loved me no matter what. Whether I fail or I succeed, she loved me always. So that was enormous, uh, uh, really, a uh, fountain of strength for her. So what advice uh, would you give to our Korean parents, especially Korean mothers? They are very powerful. And <laughs> um, boy, that's a scary question. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I don't... <clears throat> I think that... Um, let me put it this way. I think first and foremost... I think we should say that um, uh, Korean children are very, very lucky to have Korean mothers. Because at the, at the heart of that is, um, is uh, I think, uh, you know, an intense, intense um, I, uh, a love for children, right? So uh, my, I was just talking to my uncle last night, and he was saying that there was a, there's, been a, there's been a debate in Korea about tiger mothers versus bear mothers, right? Mm. And uh, he said the conclusion was that <clears throat> the reason Korean mothers are tiger mothers is because their hearts are uh, as bear mothers. They love their children so much that they, that they uh, put the pressure on. You know, I've heard some terrible stories um, uh, about um, uh, the excesses of, of different Korean mothers. Uh, but um, uh, I, not, not having lived in this culture, I hesitate to give advice. Uh, and, and I wouldn't say, well, you know, <clears throat> you should let young people, um, you, young people do whatever it is that they love. Because that's not how the structure is set up right now, right? 
I, I think that <clears throat> uh, Korea needs to make the modifications in the structure so that someone like Sai, who is brilliant artistically, uh, is not going to be you know, told that he's a failure as a student all his life, but that finds a way to pursue his, art, mm -hmm. his AQ, as you, as you put it, um, and reach the highest levels of, uh, of, of excellence. Now, you know, in 1984, when I first came here, Korean movies, Korean music was, was kind of, you know, primitive. And now the movies and the, 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 uh, 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 the artists here are among the most popular and the most uh, celebrated in all the world. And they did it completely outside the regular system that didn't value that kind of excellence. And so if Korea can create a more diverse group of institutions that are absolutely excellent and that allow um, people with different talents to, to go through just as rigorous a process that requires just as much discipline to reach the top of the field in whatever it is that they're, that they're uh, uh, trying to reach, then you don't lose the grit-producing uh, uh, mechanism that, that, that Korea loves so much. And you uh, uh, are going to create these uh, outstanding um, uh, leaders in many, many different fields. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to see you know, the best school of the performing arts, the, 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 the next Juilliard should be here in Seoul. So that you know, instead of sending you know, so many Korean students to Juilliard, uh, uh, you know, French parents uh, are desperate to send their children to Seoul to learn to play the violin. Why couldn't we do that? Given the excellence of, uh, of professionals and adults here, I, I, that's what I'd like to see uh, in, in, in the future. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you. So we have a few more questions before opening up uh, for Q&A from uh, audience. Uh, so the, I have a I'll last be, couple of questions. Yeah. Uh, the, in uh, Korea right now, Park Geun-hye government is uh, trying very, very hard for <coughs> creative economy. Uh, so in Kaisto, for instance, uh, our, the high value uh, for <coughs> our education system is creativity and the challenge. Uh, as you said, if you challenge hard, you may achieve something. Uh, but the creativity besides working very, very hard, uh, how do you think uh, we can foster creativity among young people uh, in corporate as well as in education system? How can we create a Silicon Valley-like uh, creativity for Korean industry? Uh, yeah, Korea is uh, facing very difficult time in terms of uh, uh, the global competitiveness. Although industry has done very well, but looking at uh, the future with the diminishing uh, uh, population among younger generation and so on, there are many, many uh, challenging issues. Uh, so any good advice? Just you know, to quickly, I think I, I, you know, we, we, we are studying our, our educational group and. Uh, our private sector folks are studying this process of what breeds creativity. Um, you know, part of it's a school system, but as we said, at the age of 15, Koreans have done the best in the world at this one test. Uh, you know, I, the OECD has done some fantastic work in this area. There's one test on looking at creative problem solving. Korea was number one in the world. So it's at 15, Korea is great, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that there are institutions that, that um, uh, tend to push down creativity. Uh, you know, for men, some people say that it's the army experience where, you know, you're, every bit of creativity is pounded out of you because it's, it's about order, it's about obeying orders. And, you know, there, there's value in that experience as well. But um, I, I think that they, the, the most creative organizations ha really do have a meritocracy of ideas as opposed to a hierarchy of, uh, of uh, positions, a hierarchy of age. And so I think, you know, uh, companies, countries, even at the World Bank, it's one of the most important things we're trying to do, is to, is to, really, um, uh, is to really have a meritocracy of ideas. Whoever has the best idea gets to present them and they rise up the organization. I think that's difficult here. Mm -hmm. You know, the, I, was, um, uh, the, I, I was just meeting with uh, um, uh, uh, the, the uh, queen of the Netherlands who's here in Seoul. We were, the queen and I worked together on a a global access to financial services product, project, and she was telling me that Gus Hiddink, the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the, the coach of the World Cup uh, soccer team, in, uh, was, was traveling with her. And he was saying to audiences that he'd never seen anything like it before. One of the bright young stars in the Korean national team would break away and would be ready to score a goal, but he would stop and wait for his elder to come up 
and he would pass the ball to the elder so the elder could score the goal, and they would always miss the goal, right? And he said he'd never seen anything like that before. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I think that the point is that in that particular case, right, brilliance and excellence was trumped by hierarchy. Mm -hmm. I think in every social institution, uh, Koreans have to sit back and think, you know, is this, are we allowing hierarchy to trump brilliance, to trump merit, to trump uh, creativity? And that's a difficult, complicated process for Koreans to go through, but essential to create a creative economy. Yeah, thank you very much. That's a very important point. I think a vertical structure is very strong. We need to build a more horizontal structure uh, to build a very strong uh, grid system. But the question is, who, you know, <coughs> um, uh, uh, you know, 50-year-olds, you know, when I was here first 30 years ago, we were at the low end of the totem pole, and we were always, you know, just uh, you know, being very uh, subservient, et cetera. And now that we're in this role, the question is, who's going to be the first generation of older people who've taken grief all their life from their elders to stop giving it to their juniors? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Someone has to do it, and I would suggest that this is the generation that does it. Thank you. So the last question, you are the role model uh, no. for young people everywhere in the world, uh, especially to Koreans. So you moved to U.S. at the age of five. Uh, so I think you are 1.8 generation, maybe? <laughs> this something, something like, like that. that. Something uh, like that. Uh, and then uh, you also received the MacArthur Genius Award, uh, which is the highest honor, really. So you are genius. Uh, uh, right. And uh, yet you worked hard and uh, achieved many great things. Uh, so what message would you give to our younger generation in uh, Korea? Uh, yeah. Well, I, I, would, I would say that um, uh, uh, a couple of things. First of all, I think that um, uh, if there's one discipline um, that, uh, that, that young people take on, it would be languages. Uh, you know, I have tremendous admiration for the Dutch. Uh, I've met very few Dutch people who speak less than three languages. And uh, I, I think that uh, for me, uh, the, the, uh, my study in anthropology has been hugely uh, influential. Mm -hmm. And uh, as anthropologists, we learn something called ethnography. And ethnography is um, a process where we put ourselves into a completely unfamiliar environment. Um, we become literally babies in that environment because we have to start from nothing on the language and then try to understand how a whole culture, a whole group of people see the world differently than us. And so I did that here in Korea. I came here literally speaking almost not a word of Korean and learned the language again. And even though I was born here, uh, uh, begin to try to understand well, how, you know, who are these people? What are they, what, what are they doing? Why are they doing this? And uh, that skill I use every single day. Right. My, medical, my medical training I don't use very often. My anthropological training I use every single day. And so I think uh, I, I would love to see uh, every Korean child be, be fully trilingual. <clears throat> Korean, of course. And then whatever else they choose. I mean, English is probably a good one to, to learn because so many transactions happen in English. But, it, but, you know, Chinese, French, there's so many other languages, uh, Spanish, that they can learn. Um, uh, you know, just take the time. Just take the time to learn those languages and take the time to really go out and try to understand what's happening in the rest of the world. You know, um, as Korea becomes a developed country, uh, people all over the world expect Korea uh, to be leaders, expect Korea to, to respond to Ebola, expect Korea uh, to, uh, you know, think about the well-being of poor people everywhere. Uh, if you're going to sell your products all over the world, there is an expectation that you're going to be a leader and that you're going to uh, care about the rest of the world. And I would strongly urge Korean young people to become global citizens. And global citizens doesn't mean going around the world in Korean tour groups listening to explanations in Korean. It means actually really learning these languages and exposing yourself to, to, to enormous differences and then reflecting uh, uh, what that means for, for yourself as an individual and for Korean society as a whole. Thank you very much. So now it's time to open up uh, for entertaining questions from the audience. Uh, so if you have uh, questions, so please uh, rise up. Uh, I'm Arif Rahman from Indonesia. I'm the executive chair 
for the National Commission of UNESCO, but I work in the Ministry of Education and Culture. I teach in the uni uh, State University of Jakarta, Philosophy of Science. Um, I would like to ask just one question. How do you put ethic, morals, and religion in this creativity world, uh, creative economy, and to create, to create, uh, and to create, and to create? Thank you very much. Yeah. Salam alaikum. Thank you. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I'm a great believer uh, in, uh, in liberal arts education. And uh, I, uh, uh, of course, you know, Dartmouth uh, um, over the years has been ranked the number one uh, school in undergraduate education in the United States. And part of the reason is because uh, we insist on a very broad um, educational experience in the, uh, in the college years. And so I think that, uh, you know, uh, uh, teaching specific religions is, uh, is uh, more controversial. And, uh, you know, for example, at Catholic universities, they teach Catholicism. At other institutions, they, t they teach about specific religions. But, for example, at, uh, at Dartmouth College, you could take a class in, you know, the Christian tradition. You could take classes in the Jewish tradition. Uh, and in, and uh, the academic study uh, of those uh, subjects, which were not required, uh, but were certainly uh, ones that were valued. I, I think it's very important. I think it's extremely important to teach, um, uh, you know, ethics and, and, uh, and moral reasoning. And uh, uh, the more that that can be taught well as part of any education. For example, at Dartmouth, we teach engineering students uh, about philosophy, ethics, and morals uh, uh, because we think it's important for all human beings uh, to, to have that kind of uh, support. Yes, next question. I think uh, Dr. Okay. Yes, please. Hey, Steve. How are you? Okay. And Jim, thanks for being here. Uh, two gentlemen that I respect the most. <laughs> um, Jim, you talked about um, you know, how, you got to the, how you got to where you are in various steps. I have a very specific question about the concept of mentoring, because I think you've been mentored really well. Can you tell me the value of mentoring and whether oh, you think yeah. as an educator, as a physician, as a leader, how do we structurally make mentoring work both <coughs> systematically and casually? Yeah. You know, Wyas, that's, a, that's a, a really great question, and I, I'm, I'm sorry I didn't, because it's another thing, it's another thing that I would tell Korean young people, uh, that, that one of your most important tasks is to be mentorable and to seek out mentors. Mm -hmm. So I've had so many different mentors, and I've had um, even, even my own colleagues have been my mentors. Um, you know, I've worked for years with a guy named Paul Farmer. He's my closest friend. You know, we're God fathers to each other's children, but I've always treated him at least partly as a mentor. And it's, it's you know, the, it's an old style relationship. And, and in fact, um, uh, you know, it's at the core of, uh, of uh, John Dewey's educational philosophy. You know, there was a big argument in the United States between John Dewey and Horace Mann about how to structure the American educational system, and John Dewey said it was, it was learning by doing with your mentor at your side. And there are some fields that still do that. Medicine is one, uh, uh, because you'd still go through that process of clinical training. Uh, but then Horace Mann said, no, you do it in a classroom. And because that was more cost-effective and efficient, that's what was chosen. But I don't think that necessarily means it's the best way to learn. So I have actively sought out mentors in every single situation I've ever been in. And the thing that's hard about this is that the higher you go up, the harder it is uh, to find good mentors. I'm still doing it. You know, I have a leadership coach uh, who works with me on a regular basis. Um, I seek out other uh, CEOs uh, who've done this work before, and I, I consider them mentors. Fred Hassan, the great uh, um, uh, pharmaceutical CEO who's turned around so many companies. Now that he's retired, Alan Mulally of Ford, I consider him a mentor. And I keep going back to them, keep asking them questions, sort of literally sitting at their knee, you know, giving them my problems to, to deal with. And, trying to get information. The humility to be a good mentee is a critical part of leadership in my view. Yeah. Thank you very much. Indeed, the humility is a greatness. Uh, yes, uh, there is a question uh, back there. Uh, is there a microphone? Um. Hi, my name is Benjamin Cho. I work for the Kwangun, Kwangun University uh, International Affairs Office. Um, I just wanted to ask a question about your last comment about the uh, importance of language that uh, students or uh, Koreans to uh, work on. 
to become a global leader. Um, I personally have a high doubt about it because uh, um, in, order, in order for us to have a deeper conversation, uh, especially for me when I'm working with a lot of international students, uh, faculties, um, English is the primary language that I can have uh, deep and more uh, broad in conversation with. If I, if I try to learn Chinese or Indonesian, for example, and try to speak to them, there is a limit to, uh, a limit to uh, our com com uh, communication. Um, don't you think just learning the global language, English, learning it better, uh, become a better English speaker, wouldn't it be better than try to uh, learn like Chinese or Indonesian? <laughs> you, you, you know, it's a, good it's, a, it's a good question. It's a completely fair question, right? It's a completely fair question. But um, uh, I, I would put it this way, right? I would put it this way. So um, my, the first language I learned um, uh, in high school was German. But I wasn't serious about it. I only took three years of it. And so I don't, I, I don't have any facility now. I can read a little bit. Uh, but the first time I really struggled with learning a language was here when I was learning Korean, right? Now, you know... Since 1988, when I left here, my Korean has gotten worse. But um, uh, 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 the fact that speaking Korean has opened up this whole world of Koreans to me is just a, st a stunning and wonderful experience. The next language I learned was Spanish. And then Spanish opened up the whole Latin American continent to me, which was, which was fantastic. And so for me, uh, uh, having the ability to engage deeply with Latin America and then having the ability to engage deeply with Korea has been just great. Right? And so I, don't, I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't say before you've perfected English, go on to another language and be bad at both. I wouldn't say that. What I would say, though, is that you know, there's a lot of things that you do, like play video games. Right? Uh, I would say, you know, uh, what if you didn't perfect your skill at playing a video game, but instead use that time to learn another language. That's really what, what I'm saying, right? And you know, uh, the, when I was, in, um, uh, when I was uh, uh, in college, I worked really hard at learning Korean. And uh, some of the Korean American kids would say, but you, you know, why should I learn Korean? What, what use of it, what use of, you know, will it be for me? And I said, uh, back in those old days, I said, well, uh, have you memorized all the lyrics to the Madonna songs? And they said, yeah, I know a lot of them. I said, well, why don't, instead of doing that, why don't you learn Korean and learn, le learn some Korean words and, and, and try, to, try, to, try to, uh, uh, to get better at it? So you see, the thing is, English won't serve you perfectly everywhere, not in Latin America, you know, not in large parts of, uh, of Africa, and not with the 1.3 billion people who live in China. So if, you know, I, I'm just looking at efficiency. My oldest son speaks French and Chinese and hasn't learned Korean yet because we think you know, that these are, these are critically important languages for him to do now, and later he can then learn Korean. My younger son is in a, uh, is in a Spanish bilingual school. Right? So we want them to grow up with other languages because we want them to grow up knowing that people call things different things and that people can have completely different perspectives. So um, uh, you know, it's great that you speak English as well as you do, but, you know, if you're going to pick up a hobby, I'm just saying that learning Chinese or Indonesian or whatever you want to learn might be a very good hobby for you instead of playing video games. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That was the last question. Uh, time is up now. It's uh, 10 o'clock. And uh, let us give a uh, big round of applause to Jim Kim. Thank you. Good morning. Well, that was certainly a wonderful uh, experience to listen to such a broad perspective on the world economy and education. Um, my own area of expertise is much smaller. It, I really am uh, a scientist who has studied families uh, for the past 42 years. So I'm going to talk about what trust means, and try to demonstrate a very simple principle about trust. And uh, first of all, I want to say that all of the work that I've done for the past 20 years has been a collaboration between myself 
and Dr. Julie Gottman, who is in the third row there, uh, my wife and uh, collaborator and best friend. And she has brought uh, to a work a real understanding of human nature because she is a superb therapist and very intuitive. I also, I also want to talk about uh, the fact that in Korea we have, uh, Julie and I have collaborated with Dr. Peck Cho and Dr. Christina Choi in trying to apply some of the things that we discovered between what we call the masters of human relationships and the disasters of human relationships, which is what we've studied for the past 42 years. Some people really seem to be very good at uh, love relationships and parent-child relationships. And, uh, and we've applied very simple scientific tools to observe the differences between the masters and disasters and follow couples and families for as long as 20 years, uh, observing them, looking at their physiological responses and their ways of thinking about relationships. So um, Dr. Peck Cho has, has uh, said that one of the really important things that needs to happen in the field of education is to integrate the heart and the mind. And I want to talk about that uh, in, this, in this talk. And, um, and I want to start by just uh, talking about a, a general way of understanding relationships. And you see here there are two different smiles. And which one is the real smile and which one is the false smile? And this is, uh, these are two pictures of one of my colleagues, Dr. Paul Ekman, who has spent his life studying the human face and emotional expressions. And we see on the left a smile that raises the lip corners but doesn't involve the eyes. And this is typically what happens when somebody wants to take our picture. And we stand there and they, and they say, smile. And what we do is we smile with our mouth but not with our eyes. And on the right side, we see a real smile called a Duchenne smile after the French anatomist Duchenne. And usually we react to a real smile much differently than, than we do to a false or unfelt smile. Well, in general, as we go through life and, uh, and experience human interactions, uh, we can apply a general theory of all social interactions. For example, if I smile at my wife, Julie, and she smiles back, I can think to myself, what a wonderful smile. I love her. I'm very lucky to have her as my wife. Or I can think, that isn't a very good smile. I wonder, I wonder what she's thinking. Something's wrong here. I'm not getting a real loving smile from her. I can do better. I can do better than that smile. So this is an example of how in every human social exchange, in every society, there is a mental rating in the transaction that is either positive or negative. And this is a part of human nature and really a general theory of social interaction that we need to look at what people do, what the behavior is, and also how they perceive the behavior as well. And this field of understanding of human relationships is called game theory. And it was initially invented by a man named John von Neumann and Oscar Morgenstern in 1949 for understanding economic systems. But it's a general theory for all social interaction, understanding all relationships. And I'm going to talk a little bit about this. And the basic uh, problem that has been addressed in this whole area of trust is how can we get human beings to cooperate with one another? And the usual approach, and in my field, you know, the field that Julie and I have been working in the most, which is couples therapy. How do we help couples to have better relationships? In this field of couples therapy, in the 1960s, the concept was that the best way to get people to cooperate was to negotiate logically, each from a position of self-interest, and then logically arrive at the best solution possible from positions of self-interest. In other words, if I just operate, as, as I talk to Julie about a problem we have or a decision we want to make, I will be logically 
interested in maximizing my own gains, my own payoffs, my own rewards, and she will also. And through a process of logical transaction, we'll arrive at the best solution somehow. And what I want to do is to prove to you in this very brief talk that that hypothesis is completely wrong. And I want to explain why it is wrong, why this idea is wrong, and why it has failed in the area of couples therapy, and why it is really uh, doomed to failure logically. And it really involves integrating heart and mind, very much like Dr. Peck Cho has been talking about as our fundamental challenge. So let's start with understanding a young couple. And, uh, and we'll call this couple Al and Jenny. Al is the husband and Jenny is the wife. And they are about to discuss housework. And this really comes from a real study done by John Kelly a number of years ago. And they rate four possibilities of doing housework. Either they do it together, or Al does all the housework and Jenny doesn't, or Jenny does all the housework and Al doesn't, or nobody does the housework. They leave the house to be a mess. And they, they rate each of these alternatives on a scale of zero to 10. 10 is really good and zero is a rating that it's awful. And here's what they come up with. And uh, so, you know, just bear with me for a moment. And this is, uh, this is sort of the mathematics of game theory. And we see in the top table um, Jenny's payoffs. This is how much she's rating each possibility. So if we look at the table on the upper left, we'll see that she gives a rating of 10, very high rating, to Al cleaning and herself cleaning together. Now, if Al cleans and Jenny doesn't, the top row on the right, she gives that a rating of four. So she kind of likes the idea of Al doing the work and her not doing it. But if she cleans and he doesn't, she gives that a rating of two. So she's a feminist. She really doesn't like the idea of her doing all the work. And the idea of neither one of them cleaning, that's unacceptable to her. That she gives a rating of zero. Now, if we take a look at the row totals, uh, we see that the total um, point she gives to Al doing the cleaning, whether or not she does anything, is 14. Whereas Al doing all the work and her not doing anything, regardless of what she does, she gives a total rating of two. So in other words, by getting Al to do some of the cleaning, she improves her score from two to 14. Okay. Now, uh, let's take a look at Al's table. Uh, he also gives the two of them cleaning together the highest rating, that's eight. And, uh, and then Jenny not cleaning and him cleaning, he gives that a lower rating. He gives that a rating of two. And then Jenny cleaning and him not doing any of the work, he gives that a seven. That's pretty good in his idea. That's a pretty good outcome if she does all the work. Uh, and then if nobody does the cleaning, that's not so bad. That's a two. He doesn't give that a zero. So he's okay with the house being really messy. Now let's take a look at, at his column totals. If we look at the, the columns in Al's table, if Jenny cleans, regardless of what Al does, the total is 15. If Jenny doesn't clean, the total is four. So getting Jenny to do the work will increase his score from four to 15. That's a pretty big score, big, pretty big increase. Whereas if we look at the row totals, Al cleaning or not cleaning, regardless what Jenny does, he only goes from nine to 10. He doesn't gain very much by changing his own behavior. He gains the most by changing Jenny's behavior. In other words, what we see in these two tables is that it is logically in Jenny's best interest to get Al to do cleaning of the house. It is logically from a position of self-interest, the best thing that Al can do is to get Jenny to clean because he gains the most points doing this. So again, if they do look only from a position of self-interest, they will argue completely to get the other one to clean. And this is called the von Neumann equilibrium. If we go back, we can see that in fact, 
This equilibrium is what is known as the best of the worst alternatives. So you can see that uh, the worst alternatives for Jenny are four, two, and zero, right, in her table. And the best of the worst is four. And there she gets Al to clean and she doesn't. That's the best of the worst. For Al, the best of the worst is, the, the three worst are two, two, and seven. So seven is the best of the worst. And that means he doesn't clean and he gets Jenny to clean. So the von Neumann equilibrium, which is what von Neumann looked at in his 1949 book that started game theory, is cut your losses. That's the strategy. So that if people are operating from a position of self-interest only, they will always wind up at the solution that is the best of the worst. But if we look back at the table again, the highest rated alternative for both Al and Jenny are both of them to clean. Neither one of them can do any better by changing either their own behavior or their partner's behavior than cleaning together. And this alternative, where they both clean, is called the Nash Equilibrium. And as you remember, if you've seen uh, the movie that honored John Nash uh, that, you know, for winning a Nobel Prize, Nash's equilibrium is really the best of the best, which means it is a solution to this problem where neither one of them can do any better by any unilateral change of their own behavior or their partner's behavior. So how do you get to the Nash equilibrium? How do you get people to cooperate? And the answer is, it is impossible by this counterexample, as you see, to get people to the best alternative, the Nash equilibrium, by operating from a position only of self-interest. To get to the Nash equilibrium, where they clean together, where they, neither one of them can do any better, they each need to be maximizing their partner's welfare. They have to be thinking of a solution that involves not only their own self-interest, but their partner's welfare as well. She needs to be maximizing his payoffs and he needs to be maximizing hers. So therefore, if they operate just from a position of self-interest, Jenny will try to change Al, and Al will try to change Jenny, because rational thinking means only maximizing self-interest. So this couple will fight tooth and nail, and they'll never reach the Nash equilibrium. So what this is saying is that it is a logical implication of getting humans to cooperate, that each of them operate from a position of empathy and compassion for the other person's outcome. This is especially true in a love relationship and in a family relationship. So if we define a trust metric as Jenny trying to maximize Al's payoffs and Al trying to maximize Jenny's payoffs, then they will always arrive at the Nash equilibrium if it exists. So this, com this implies that logically, compassion is the only solution to negotiation rather than negotiating from a principle of self-interest. And this was the mistake that couples therapy made in the 1960s by just assuming that the therapist could negotiate a contract between husband and wife and they would both be very happy with the alternative. In other words, empathy and compassion come out logically as necessary to get humans to cooperate. Logically and mathematically necessary, okay? That's the only way you arrive at the Nash equilibrium if it exists. That means that only if uh, Al and Jenny negotiate with empathy, meaning taking one another's perspective in order to maximize the outcome of both people, only then can they arrive at the best solution, the Nash equilibrium, okay? So, that implies that trust means that both people in negotiation, in discussion, in interaction, are considering the needs of the other person as well as their own needs. That means, for example, the implication is the only way the Israelis and the Palestinians can ever arrive at a peaceful solution is if the Israelis are considering the Palestinians' need for autonomy and if the Palestinians are considering the Israeli need for security and existence as a state. 
Until that happens, they never will arrive at the Nash equilibrium. They'll always arrive at the best of the worst, which is the von Neumann equilibrium. Okay, in marital relationships, this next diagram shows that when couples operate with a low trust metric, and what I mean by trust here is this idea of considering your partner's outcomes and what's good for your partner and not just what's good for you. If there's a high trust metric, and here, you know, what I'm saying is trust is not simply a trait or a quality. It's really what you build as you interact with your partner, with your children, with your lover, and the person you work with. In all social interactions, this is necessary to arrive at the Nash equilibrium. When it doesn't exist, what we've discovered is this diagram. And this is called the Markov absorbing state. It's a mathematical state, and what we see here are two circles. And in couples' interaction, as we observe them, we look at facial expressions, we look at emotions, we look at physiology, and one circle, the one on, on the right, is neutral emotion, which turns out to be very good in a conflict discussion, or positive emotion, affection, interest in one another, and empathy. And the other circle, the one on the left, is negative interaction. This is anger, contempt, criticism, disgust, all of these negative emotions, sadness, disappointment in one another. And for unhappy couples, we see that there is a very fat arrow going from neutral or positive to negative. In other words, it's very easy for unhappily married couples, for dysfunctional systems, to get into this state of negative affect. And we see by the return arrow that is very fat, that it's very easy to stay in that state of negativity. It becomes an absorbing state. Whereas going from negative to positive or neutral is a very thin line, which means the probability of exiting the negative state is very small. What this means for dysfunctional couples and families is what we call the Roach Motel model of unhappy marriage. And that means they check in, but they don't check out. They're stuck at war with one another. They're stuck at increasingly escalating negativity. For unhappy couples, negative emotions like disappointment and sadness and anger and contempt and disgust with one another is like stepping in a quicksand bog. No matter how much they move, they continue to stay in negative affect. Negative affect then becomes an absorbing state for these unhappy couples because they're operating with a low trust metric. Each of them is operating only from their own self-interest and not considering compassionately what their partner needs. So they never arrive at the Nash equilibrium and repair does not work for them. So one of the things we've discovered in our research on couples' relationships is that really communication is very difficult and that it's very easy to make mistakes in communication, to really hurt your partner's feelings, to say the wrong thing. And the masters of relationships, both parent-child relationship and couples love relationships, are those who repair, not those who never make mistakes, but those who are able to repair. And the ones who can repair do not get stuck in negativity because repair works only because they're working from a high trust perspective. In other words, they're thinking about not only their own self-interest, but their partner's self-interest as well. So uh, happily married couples are, get into the negative state. Uh, they do make mistakes, they do hurt one another's feelings, but they're able to exit their state easily, much more easily, because they do effective repairs like taking responsibility for even a part of the problem, which has turned out to be one of the most effective repair mechanisms that couples make during conflict. And this is especially effective when a woman does this for a man. If a woman says to a man, I know this isn't all your fault. I play an important role in this miscommunication as well. That is a very, very effective repair mechanism for men to hear. And happily married couples are able to do this. So how does one build trust? How does one go about the process? How do couples actually naturally go about this process? And the basic thing that we've discovered is in all new relationships, 
and particularly 130 newlywed couples we studied in Seattle. The real question is, are you there for me? Trust is built in small moments by couples, and it is a specific social skill that is built, and we call that skill attunement. And I'll explain what I mean by that. It's really about being able to talk about these mistakes in interaction, these ways in which we hurt our partner's feelings, the way we miscommunicate, the way we miss each other, and really being able to revisit those moments and talk about it and communicate to our partner, you know, when you hurt, baby, when you're upset, the world stops and I listen. That's the way trust is built by this process of attunement. Now, we call this emotion coaching for children, really sort of zeroing in on a child's emotion when the child is upset and understanding preceding advice for children. And we've tested this emotion coaching approach in the United States and Australia and in Korea. And this builds trust with kids. But it also does in new relationships and love relationships. So in entire family relationships, the question of trust opens up like a huge fan. And the fundamental question in all segments of this fan is, are you there for me? Will you be there for me? When I'm upset, will you listen to me? Will you be sexually faithful to me? Will you be attracted to me? Am I more important than your mother? Am I more important to you than your friends? Will you be there if I'm lonely, if I'm upset? Will you listen to me? Will you treat me with respect and honor? Can I talk to you? And the motto of all happy relationships, and this is what builds trust, is when you are upset, when something's wrong, the world stops and I listen. And the motto of every failed relationship is when you are upset and when you're down, when the world isn't going your way, I have a lot more to do than deal with your emotions. And you're on your own. I'm too busy with life, with work, with children to stop and listen to your needs. And when that happens, the trust metric erodes. And people have to wind up at the von Neumann equilibrium, which is a place where you're getting the best of the worst rather than the best of the best. So what is the skill of attunement? And what we mean by attune is really these six things. The A stands for awareness, being aware of the feelings and needs of your partner, and also the feelings and needs of your children, which really means actively listening. And every now and then asking your child and asking your partner, how's the world treating you, honey? Talk to me, I wanna know. Turning toward is the T, really turning toward those needs. Showing tolerance that really your own point of view is not the only point of view. And the goal being understanding, listening non-defensively, and empathy. It is only then that you arrive at the Nash equilibrium, which is the best of the worst. And so attunement is a very simple skill that we can teach. And if there's not attunement, we get what psychologists call the Zygarnik effect. And this effect was one that was discovered by a woman named Bluma Zygarnik in 1922. And basically the Zygarnik effect is we recall unfinished events much better than events that we have finished. And the ratio is about two to one. Things that haven't been completed, that are left unprocessed, untalked about, uh, seem to really dominate our dreams and maybe the basis of all neurosis, the rumination on unprocessed, unfinished negative events. We tend to dwell on the negative. And yet, if we attune, if we process these negative events, these places that are a stone in our shoe, that really uh, we dwell on the negative that has happened in our relationship, become the greatest sources of intimacy once they're talked about, once we attune. And then we negotiate from a position of empathy and concern about our partner's outcomes as well as our own, and we arrive at the Nash Equilibrium. So the result of all of this is that without trust, through attunement, through building attunement, we'll always arrive at the best of the worst solution. With trust through attunement, logically, we'll always arrive at the Nash Equilibrium, the best of the best if it happens. 
Thank you very much for listening. 여러분 수고해 주신 존 가츠맨 교수님께 다시 한번 큰 박수 부탁드립니다.